House will come to order. <laughs> calendar for the day. First file on the calendar for the day is Senate file number 3306. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> Senate file number 3306, number one on the calendar for the day, an act relating to campaign finance, the third engrossment. I recognize the member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll, to your, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, House, uh, excuse me, Senate File 3306 is the Campaign Finance Board bill for this session. And a quick overview of the things that are in the Campaign Finance Bill. And before I do that, I want to thank Representative Nelson, who is a co-author of this bill. And as we know here in the state of Minnesota, that when we do elections and when we do campaign finance, uh, both Governor Tim Pawlenty and our current Governor Mark Dayton have had a policy that we have to have strong bipartisan support. And we do believe we have that with this bill. A couple of highlights in the bill. It raises uh, the uh, amount of money that that needs to be disclosed on the ESI statement to index that to inflation. It also clarifies some of the board's investigative authority. It also clarifies in this day and age where we don't necessarily have contributors handing us a check where they may be doing an electronic transfer of funds, what, what is the date that we would receive those in our campaigns. Also um, ties the mileage reimbursement for candidates when they're performing their campaign duties um, to comply with the IRS regulations. Also clarifies a disclaimer language for local candidates and committees. Provides um, some clarification for non-coordination and uh, of, uh, excuse me, non-coordinated and coordinated expenditures uh, for clarification for um, campaigns. Also um, talks about the obligations for reporting reimbursements, and it also provides some additional information, uh, disclosure requirements when we um, fill out our campaign finance reports. And finally, Mr. Speaker and members, it also clarifies for us uh, when does the legislative day begin and when does it end as it relates to um, when we begin in January in the first year of the biennium or later and when is the exact, when do we determine by law the actual last day of session is for campaign related activities. Mr. Speaker, with that, I stand for questions. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Nelson moves to amend Senate file number 3306, the third engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded A6. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson, to your amendment. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And this is a, an issue that was brought to me after this bill went through the committee process. Mr. So. Speaker, point of order. Representative Krisha, for what purpose do you rise? Point of order, Mr. Speaker. State your point of order. Mr. Speaker, I rise to a point of order of 3.21 on germaneness, and I am prepared to offer advice. Representative Krisha, state your advice. Mr. Speaker, members, uh, I looked through the amendment, and I'm sure we could have a robust debate on it, but the fact of the matter is this amendment will not be germane, and I will ask you to find that point well taken. Um, if you refer to lines 1.12 1 and 1.14 of the amendment, you'll see that we are expanding this amendment greatly by giving Campaign Finance Board the authority to have jurisdiction over every candidate's personal expenses and finances. There's no enforcement in this amendment, and it requires uh, many staff that won't be included in this amendment. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, this amendment greatly expands this bill and is not germane. Advice? Representative Nelson, state your advice. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, this amendment is a it, it's in the same section of law. It's about the same thing that the Campaign Finance Board bill is about. It's about disclosure. It's about making sure that people aren't being given money on the side that uh, could be construed as a campaign con contribution. And therefore, Mr. 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 Speaker, this member is definitely in order, and I, I urge you to rule the objection out of order. Mr. Speaker, advice? 
Representative Pinto, state your advice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I simply want to direct your attention uh, again to the ruling from two days ago, and I believe that Mr. Speaker it was you who was in the chair at that point uh, when the issue in the underlying amendment had to do with uh, renters' credits, had nothing to do with local government aid. Representative Dreskowski had a secondary amendment having to do with local, local government aid. It was uh, Chernow Block that made the point they both had to do with property taxes, and therefore it was Jermaine. The Speaker uh, 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 found the point of order not well taken, and actually the majority ended up upholding the Speaker's ruling. Mr. Speaker, consistent with that, I would uh, uh, certainly urge uh, that this point of order uh, be found uh, not well taken. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, advice. Representative Freiberg, state your advice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the acknowledgement. Um, the again. Th this is an issue, I believe a, uh, an, an amendment was, was held germane yesterday. Uh, this deals with the same section of statute. If you look at the amendment, it amends section 211B.15. If you look uh, right there in the title of the bill on line 1.10, it, uh, it amends section 211B.04 of the Minnesota statutes. They both, uh, both the amendment and the bill amend uh, chapter 211B of the Minnesota statutes. That is the standard by which we typically judge germaneness, so I urge the speaker to find the point of order not well taken. Representative Krisha. Mr. Speaker, further advice? State your advice. Mr. Speaker, just a point of clarification. Um, I can take you in my fishing boat, but you may not be a fisher person. Just because you're in proximity does not mean it's germane. This absolutely inserts into here a new section and we can say it's close, it's a close cousin, it's a friend, it's a brother, it's a sister, but the fact of the matter is it greatly expands the scope of the amendment. And for that, Mr. Speaker, I ask you to rule the point well taken. Members, uh, after uh, listening to advice from uh, Representative Krisha, Nelson, Pinto, and Freiburg, uh, the, the, it is the decision of the chair that the point is well taken. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Nelson moves to amend Senate file number 3306. The third engrossment as follows, and the amendment is coded A5. Recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Mr. Speaker, this is another amendment, again, that was, didn't have a chance to bring it up in committee. It was an issue that was brought to me after the bill made it to the General Register. And what this is, it's about lobbying, about members lobbying that are running for office, and, and uh, so that there's disclosure about who's, who they're being paid for by, who they work for. And Mr. Speaker, that's what this amendment does, and I um, ask for a green vote. Discussion to the amendment. The representative from Stearns, Representative Overstgold. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, I'm going to ask that you vote no on the A5 amendment. And um, Mr. Speaker, I'd like a roll call on this, please. Roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative I, um, O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Nelson, I, I think I know what you're trying to do here, and um, I will just want to remind members that if this amendment actually does go on the bill and becomes law, 
What this does is this opens up about 2,100 um, registered folks with the department, or I should say with the campaign finance board, and will affect companies such as Delta, 3M, um, the AFL-CIO, Children's Hospital, Best Buy, among others, and it actually will affect members that are in this chamber right now who are elected because they work for some of these organizations that Representative Nelson uh, would cover by this. And so members, I would just ask that you vote no. Uh, a red vote would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further discussion? Seeing none, a roll call being requested. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Clerk will close the roll. There being 44 ayes and 78 nays, the amendment is not adopted. There are no more amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. <clears throat> third reading, Senate file number 3306. Third reading. Discussion to the bill. The member from Hennepin, Representative Carlson L. Yes, Mr. Speaker, um, would uh, Representative O'Driscoll yield to a question? And I'm uh, looking at uh, subdivision three on page 16, uh, line 16.9 through uh, 16.12, food and beverages legislative duties. And for the members that uh, don't have a copy of the bill uh, before them, a candidate's committee may, um, let's see, am I looking at the right line here? Um, um, the, the point I wanted to find out is, um, if I've got the right lines there, but at any rate, somewhere in the bill, that may not be that, those lines. Uh, you can't cover the uh, cost of food and beverages if the event is being held outside your district. Um, let me give you an example. Let's say you're having a uh, joint uh, door knock um, and uh, one of the candidates at the joint door knock uh, doesn't happen to uh, live where they're hosting it. I'll use myself as an example. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have a fairly nice sized home and so we have a number of political events in our home. And so my expenditures would be made in my district in that case. But sometimes we're having a door knock or an event where we invite other candidates to participate and my home isn't in their district. But yet we share the costs. So would we be prohibited from doing that and the other example I, I have um, is um, after the uh, election, and I'll just share a, um, a comment. My wife went to an event in Golden Valley, and they have a brand new community center. We live just a couple of blocks out of Golden Valley. I used to represent part of Golden Valley, but I don't any longer. So my wife said, oh, gee, that would be a beautiful venue for an election night party that's out of the district by a couple of blocks. But it's a problem when you're in the metro area where facilities are. And so my question is, then would we be prohibited from doing that or sharing expenses when it's out of the, the district? Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Representative Carlson. That's a great question, and the answer is no. 
what happens is it will be, be recoded as a non-campaign expenditure to a campaign expenditure, so it follows you as the candidate and where you go for your activities. So that does happen not only in the metro area, but it happens in greater Minnesota. You may have one community that's close to another, so you have parade volunteers that go from, from one event to another. Um, but if they were working with my campaign, I would be able to, even though we were outside of the district because it was my campaign. What it does, it takes it from a non-campaign reporting to a campaign reporting expenditure. That's all it does. Yeah. And Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative that's, Carlson. that's good to hear. And I'll just, uh, to recap it, uh, some of you may remember uh, Sandy Peterson and our district line ran right up the street that I happened to live on. Across the street was her district. North side of the street was my district and happened to be where my home is. We did some joint events uh, for a variety of reasons. One was the close proximity to both districts. And we would sometimes host the event. So you're saying that that would be fine for, if we were to have a like situation for that other candidate to share the expenses if we had food and beverage and so on uh, for volunteers. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wasn't sure if Representative Carlson was making a statement or if he was asking a question on that, but the answer is it follows the candidate. Non-campaign expenditure used to be reported, now it's a campaign expenditure. So wherever you go, your campaign goes, is a way to think about that. Further discussion to the bill. Member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This is a, this is a decent bill. It's a good bill that we got. It's brought, it was brought to us by the Campaign Finance Board, and um, it's about disclosure in our elections and putting into, into statute some of the rules that they were trying to propagate over the past few years and having some issues getting, getting the rule, going through the rule, rulemaking procedure. So they brought it as a statute, which trumps rules any day. But, Mr. Speaker, this, uh, and members, this... I just lost my train of thought here, but this, like I said, it's a good bill. It's, it's, uh, some of the, there has been some issues in this bill that the, some of the proposed rules that were out there were published and people were reading those proposed rules and they've been contacting us on some of these issues. Reading the proposed rule, but the law that was, the statute was different than the, the, the proposed rules were. And that's some of the confusion that some of the groups have had on this bill. But going forward, this will be a decent bill and it'll help us keep our elections clean in Minnesota. The member from Hennepin, Representative Dean R. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And will Representative O'Driscoll yield to a question? He will yield, Representative Dean. So, you had just had a count, you know, we just had some discussion between you and Representative Carlson regarding legislative sort of people inside their district and people outside their district. You know, we also have statewide candidates. And many of those statewide candidates travel outside of the state to raise money or for other events. Would this then apply to them? Any sort of expense associated with it would have to be, one, label a campaign contribution to them, and then two, that would also then be an expense against their own campaign committee for a campaign expense. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Dean. Where you are, your campaign is. The member from Dakota, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would uh, Representative O'Driscoll yield for a couple questions? He will yield, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative O'Driscoll, I have a couple clarifying questions on page 16 and 17. And the first one, I'm looking on 16.32 and 16.33 uh, on membership fees and dues. So I'm going to use my, myself for an example and see what the practical impact is. Two, two weeks ago, I went to Tanucci's uh, restaurant, and they had a National Wild Turkey Federation uh, dinner. And as part of the fee for the dinner, they pay, you pay your membership dues. It's wrapped into the, um, the fee for that food. How would that, how would that be dealt with, with 16.32, 16.33? What would I need to do there? Representative O'Driscoll. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Hansen, that's another good question. And the answer to that is um, it would, the campaign finance board, I'm not speaking for them, but how they have dealt with this in the past, and this is clarifying language, it becomes the question. Is it a cost uh, that you would otherwise not have except for being a part of the, uh, as a candidate or an office holder? So um, I'm not sure if the campaign finance board has contemplated specifically your situation that you're talking about. Um, so I'm not going to speak for the campaign finance board today. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh, uh, Representative O'Driscoll, as the author of the bill, you're in changing the law, your intent or the how, if we're changing the law here and it's clarifying, how, how does it clarify that? How, uh, because if we're punting that back to the campaign finance board, they may watch what we're doing here and look for guidance as to the debate. So I, I guess as the author, I'm asking you what what that means, if you would yield, Mr. Speaker. You will yield. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Representative Hansen. This is one of the items that Representative Nelson and others have talked about that was an advisory opinion. So it doesn't change anything under the current um, way that the board deals with this. It just simply puts it into statute that says this is what the law is going to be so that we don't get a different opinion from a different board in the future. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'll, I'll try a different question on a different subject. On page 17, line 17.7, uh, 17.8, 17 17.9, and I'll, I'll use again uh, myself as an example. If I go to a conference and I bring my son along, uh, who's four, 14 today, um, and that doesn't, if, if we're getting mileage in the car or we stay at a hotel uh, and it has no additional cost, that's still, uh, looking at that, that's allowable. Is that correct, if you would yield? Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Hansen, it follows the same as we've mentioned before, as Representative Nelson has mentioned, that we've incorporated a number of advisory opinions. This is as well, and so it does not increase the amount of expense. It's just, again, so we don't get a different opinion from a different board in the future that is codified in law, which is the way that we've been working in the current advisory opinion. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I was hoping for a little more guidance there, uh, but it appears that we won't get it, uh, and we'll have to look at the face value uh, of the legislation when it passes. Further discussion? Representative O'Driscoll? The member from Hennepin, Representative Anderson S. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Driscoll, I just have a, one question for you. Are you asking? I yield. Oh, I, to yield, yes, please. You will yield, Representative Anderson. Um, Representative Driscoll, I think I know what your intent is, and I just want to make sure that it's part of the legislative record. And I'm looking on page 15 of the bill, and it's talking about how the recipient can register people to vote, um, and that counts as a services to constituent and as a non-campaign disbursement. I assume that it's your interpretation and legislative intent that that would only be for registering people to vote that are in your legislative district, correct? You can't go to somebody else's legislative district and register them to vote. Is that correct? Representative Anderson. Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Anderson, could you identify the lines on page 15 that you're referencing? Representative Anderson, S. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Driscoll, it's on lines uh, 17 and 18. And it's, uh, it's, it's describing uh, non-campaign disbursements. Uh, it says that that includes congratulatory letters and so forth, and also how the recipient can register to vote. And I'm assuming it's your intent, legislative intent, that that would only be for constituents that you represent and you can't go to somebody else's district and register people to vote. Representative O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Anderson. Thank you again for the clarification on that. You're, you are correct. It is not specific, and it is my legislative intent that the answer would be no, that we would not add to your question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Anderson. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill.
speaker. Moran votes aye. Clerk will close the roll. There being 123 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File Number 3265. Clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> House File Number 3265, number five on the calendar for the day, an act relating to human services, the second engrossment. I call him on the member from Morrison, Representative Cresha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, members. Um, this bill is a continuation of a bill that you voted for last session, and I'm happy to work with Representative Bennett, who also has included language in this bill. And what this does is last session we passed a bill that allowed for fetal alcohol syndrome training as part of the foster care certification. So when you entered into the foster care certification system, uh, there's some continuing ed credits that you had to take, and one of those was uh, designated as fetal alcohol syndrome. That was so well received and we saw the benefits of it that the groups came back and asked that we extend this into their recertification process. So all we're doing is making this part of the training that they already have. And if you're aware of, and I know many of us are, the awareness around fetal alcohol syndrome is so important because these foster care parents are oftentimes dealing with kids that are coming from such a varied background that can have all kinds of trauma. I mean, they're in foster care for a reason. And getting that information to those foster care parents so that they can understand what they may be dealing with in that troubled youth makes a big difference in, in the success. So, members, I urge your support on this bill. I think a green vote is absolutely the right thing to do. And this is one of those ones where you go home and your head hits the pillow and you know you just did the right thing. And so with that, I will yield to Representative Bennett to introduce her part of the bill. She will yield. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, I am so excited about this provision in this bill. Uh, this provision was brought to me by foster care youth themselves. It's called the Foster Care Sibling, or the Foster Sibling Bill of Rights. And what it does basically is set guidelines or best practice um, saying that our foster children and young people deserve to be with their siblings when at all possible and when appropriate. For example, we know how important our siblings are to us. Can you imagine how much more important siblings are to our foster young people who have had to leave their families for one reason or another? And that basically is their only connection to their family. So what this provision does is ask that these young people be placed together in the same home when possible. If not, it asks that they can communicate regularly, regularly, attend birthday parties, and all the things that we enjoy doing with our siblings. So um, thank you uh, for hearing this, and uh, would ask you for a green vote as well. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the <clears throat> bill its third reading. <clears throat> third reading, House File Number 3265. Third reading. Discussion to the bill. Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 120 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and is title agreed to.
Rep Representative Bennett, for what purpose do you rise? Uh, Mr. Speaker, a point of personal privilege. State your point of personal privilege. Members, I have the honor today to have two of these foster, <laughs> two of these beautiful young women. Um, <clears throat> now they're going to make me cry. <laughs> these two young women are part of the Minnesota leadership councils from across the state. Um, they are youth leaders who are currently or have been in foster care. Sasha Martin and Brianna Buckalton are two leaders from the Minnesota Leadership Council. Thanks for standing, young ladies. And um, they both have personal experiences growing up in foster care. And they understand the significance of siblings staying connected when they're in foster care. They had a significant part in bringing this bill together, and I would just like to recognize these young women right now. I'm very proud of them. So. The next bill on the calendar for the day is Senate File 3525. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> Senate File number 3525, number two on the calendar for the day, an act relating to local government. Recognize the member from Stearns, Representative O'Driscoll, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This bill um, deals with the Metropolitan Airports Commission. In the state of Minnesota, we do have salary caps on government-related um, appointments and, and positions. And the Metropolitan Airports Commission, which is a, uh, the manager of publicly owned airports, both the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport and regional airports, have been bumping up against a salary cap, which has been causing difficulty for them to uh, recruit and retain qualified senior staff. As a matter of fact, it's been reported to me that we've had individuals who have left the Metropolitan Airports Commission in Minnesota to go to work for smaller regional airports making more money and having less responsibility. As we all know, this airport in Minneapolis-St. Paul and the regional connecting hubs is extremely important to Minnesota's economic vitality and to public safety. So what we're doing is, um, since the state of Minnesota does not put any money into this and they generate their income from gate fees, landing takeoff fees, parking ramp revenue, leases in the corridors and, and terminals. They're what I would consider to be an enterprise or a quasi-private, quasi-government uh, entity. And so what we want to do is oftentimes try to allow government to be more competitive and act like um, business. This is an opportunity for the Metropolitan Airports Commission to be able to do just that. So members, I appreciate your support. Thank you. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. <clears throat> third reading, Senate file number 3525. Third reading. Discussion to the bill. Discussion to the bill. Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 124 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Next bill on the calendar for the day is Senate File 2777. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> Senate file number 2777, 
Number three on the calendar for the day, an act relating to state government, the first engrossment. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Pugh, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I'm pleased to bring Senate File 2777 to you today, a bill which makes several non-controversial modifications to the Commission of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. The Commission of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing is a state agency which has been in statute since 1985. The Commission serves 20% of Minnesotans who are deaf deaf-blind or hard of hearing, and develops public policy solutions to communicate barriers that really help um, the issues that this population faces. Hearing loss is the second most prevalent condition that can be identified at birth, the number one disability veterans experience, and the one most older adults will experience in their life. In fact, members, two out of every three people over age 70 experience hearing loss. Examples of legislation that Commission has helped uh, lead are newborn hearing screening and supports for babies and families with hearing loss and the captioning that we see on the TVs here at the legislature. So Senate File uh, 2777 proposes the following changes to current statute. First, um, a name change. The current name change is the Commission of Deaf, uh, or Commission of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing Minnesotans. And so one simple thing that um, the bill does is just drop the word Minnesotans. Um, the Commission for Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing is how most people refer to and know of of the Commission. The second um, is a change in the length of the terms and the number of terms. Um, the, the length of the term is going from three years to four years, and the number of terms, thank you Mr. Speaker, the number of terms is going from two terms to three, which would also put a cap of 12 years um, on an individual serving on the Commission, and this will really help, um, help the Commission greatly. Also, um, it creates a transition period to ensure a real a balance, a, a better balance of experienced versus new members of the commission, um, which will really uh, help a lot also. And then lastly, um, the commission may establish an executive committee. And the executive committee must have a, a minimum of three members, and it also has um, the authority to um, approve contracts not to exceed $50,000. So a contract, for example, would likely be um, services for the, um, for the hearing impaired. So that is my bill, Mr. Speaker, and I would appreciate support. Seeing no amendments at the desk, the clerk will give the bill a third reading. <clears throat> third reading, Senate file number 2777. Third reading. Further discussion? The clerk will take the roll on the bill. There being 124 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill for the calendar for the day is Senate File 3466. The clerk will report the bill. Senate file number 3466, number four on the calendar for the day, an act relating to public safety. Nash from Carver. The gentleman from Carver, Representative Nash, to your bill. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, Senate File 3466 is a bill to allow motorcycle permit holders to get an education by also being allowed to drive on the interstate. Um, members, it is supported by the Motorcycle Safety Task Force, which reports into uh, DPS. Um, it is brought to us also by our friends at ABATE, who are just trying to make sure that motorcyclists have a safe experience by being exposed to all aspects of driving. Uh, it uh, passed 67 to 0 out of the Senate, but don't hold that against me for the uh, less deliberative body. Uh, members, it's a very straightforward bill, and I would stand for questions. <clears throat> Seeing no amendments at the desk, the clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate file number 3466. Third reading, discussion to the bill. The gentleman from Hennepin, Representative Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, would Representative Nash yield to a question? He so, will yield. Uh, thank you. Um, I know that this is widely accepted, uh, <clears throat> but young motorcycle riders going 80 miles an hour on a freeway seems to me to be a dangerous situation. And I know that all we're doing is striking the, the one line in, 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 in statute that allows them to drive on freeways. Now, I know that there are, are, are few other conditions, and I'm curious what the conversation is going on relative to that as far as like driving at night uh, as far as driving with another passenger, and of course the one that often gets talked a lot about, and I think that um, that those in adulthood should be able to make that decision, and that's driving with headgear or not. Do you anticipate moving forward that now that we're beginning to allow them to drive on freeways, individuals with permits, that we can expect in the future that soon it will be that uh, Motorci motorcycle riders that are riding under a permit are going to be, one, allowed to carry passengers, and then two, allowed to drive at night, and then lastly, of course, be able to drive without, um, without a helmet. And, and, I, and I bring this to you not as someone who's, who's not only concerned for young people with permits, but, but I've been riding motorcycles a long time, uh, and I remember when I was young and learning how to ride, that there's nothing we can do as a legislature to make motorcycle riding more safe for people other than testing them and training. Anytime a car hits a motorcycle, the car wins. Uh, and, and I just, I mean, I understand that this makes sense, that at some point they have to go on a freeway uh, but I would think that the time for them to go on a freeway is actually once they've learned how to really handle their motorcycle and at the point in which they've learned to be as best of a defensive driver as possible. In other words, anticipating what any car might do that might be totally unexpected. So uh, if you could just speak to, you know, are we starting a point where in the future we may need, we may be revisiting some other parts of the statute. The gentleman from Carver, Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Dean, I first wanted to point out that driving 80 on the highway would be frowned upon by law enforcement officials, and I would never want to encourage that. Um, but I would say that this bill deals with just people on learner's permits. It doesn't have anything to do with helmets. It doesn't have anything to do with some of your other questions. I don't have a bill currently to do that, so I can't speak to what's going to be done by future legislature, le legislators and future legislatures, so I don't know. But the goal of the bill uh, is to provide the experience or the opportunity for someone to, one, take advantage of what we passed into law last year through my motorcycle safety license plate to go through that class and then on their permit, much like you and I have done when we took our learner's permit to drive on the highway, experience that to make sure that they know how to navigate that well. And we heard in committee, and I believe, I, I don't remember if you serve on transportation, I believe you do not, okay? So we heard in, in uh, committee that there was a, a young driver who was riding on Highway 10. It's a county highway, lots of ins and outs, ons and offs, and the statistics that we show 
uh, from both other states and, and uh, analysis is that it's more dangerous to ride on a county highway than it is on a co more controlled interstate. So what we heard as testimony is this is going to allow them to have, one, the experience of being able to be exposed to that type of riding, but two, that it's actually quite safer because there are fewer on, ons and offs on the highway, and um, that's, that's what the, the goal of the bill is trying to accomplish there, Representative Dean. John from Hennepin, Representative Dean. Well, I, I understand the sort of statistics or the numbers that you reference, that it's safer to drive on a freeway than it is on a regular road because of on and offs and all those other types of things. I don't know that study. I don't know what it took in account for. Uh, you know as well as I do that we can all find studies that prove our point, uh, that that's not the major issue. I just, I get my permit today. I'm 16 years old to ride my motorcycle. I take my motorcycle and I go out on the freeway. Now, I don't want to be that car driving on the freeway when they're coming down and they're merging and they're not like, you know, because they don't have command of their motorcycle yet. They're still learning how to ride. Uh, I'm just really, really concerned about this. And I know that it, it seems to make logic, makes complete sense, but, you know, this place, sometimes things that seem really logical to us at first glance, we end up finding uh, that they're not logic. So, so uh, I know it's going to be broadly supported today, but I will be voting no, and I hope that some other folks will actually think a little bit about young people on motorcycles and what that means for them to be driving on the freeway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further discussion, the gentleman from Hennepin, Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Chair and speakers, and it's kind of hard to think about motorcycles when just a couple weeks ago we were pretty covered in white snow. But uh, this is a good bill. I uh, ride motorcycle myself, and I would just say to you that whether you're on US 10 or whether you're on any of the other divided four-lane state highways or US highways, that is separate from the interstate, which is the prohibition. So. I think, uh, Representative Dean, and I mentioned this in our own caucus, I think it's the interstates that only have a posted minimum speed. And I would think that most people, if they're learning how to drive a motorcycle, would exercise their own discretion to stay off of the road while they're uh, learning uh, their skills. But members, mostly uh, distracted driving, please uh, remember the an acronym C, start seeing motorcycles. Um, not all of them are loud. Uh, increasingly, a lot of them are uh, much more quiet, and they're much easier to be in your blind spot. So when you are driving, uh, please recognize that it's the season. We are seeing, unfortunately, 50 to 60 motorcycle fatalities per year, and that as part of the crash data of roughly 400 traffic-related deaths per year is too many with regard to the low preponderance of motorcycles versus cars. So uh, as we head into the spring, Please uh, pay attention to motorcycles. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The lady from Olmsted, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, these are always difficult issues. I think we all really want to make sure that our citizens are safe on the road. And certainly, people who are learning to ride a motorcycle, we want them to be safe, and we want the general motoring public to be safe as well. I wonder if Representative Nash would yield to a question. The gentleman will yield, the lady from Olmsted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Nash, I, um, I'm kind of a little bit on the fence here, but one thing that I would like to see if we're going to make this change or wanted to ask you, is someone going to be collecting data so that we can actually look and see what the effect of this provision is? Maybe there'll be no effect at all, and I guess that would probably be a good thing. But I, I'd like us to be able to come back later and make sure that we did the right thing for the people of Minnesota. Gentleman from Carver, Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Liebling. That's a great question. The Motorcycle Safety Task Force does gather this data, 
And in speaking to several members of Abate, they uh, do compare what our data collection is versus other states, and they say that there is just an overwhelming amount of data that is collected. So I can almost guarantee you that they will be following this, so they will be creating more data sets for us to analyze the effect of this uh, moving forward. Thank you. The lady from Olmstead, Representative Liebling. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that, Representative Nash, and I hope that, you know, if um, you know, I, I think you're, um, the bill makes some sense, just logically. I'm not on the committee, but hearing the explanation, I think it does make some sense. Um, but I hope that if it turns out that we're actually increasing fatalities, God help us with this, that we'll be willing to come back and change it the other way. I'm not going to ask you to yield again, but, you know, I think we should be looking at what actually happens to the best that we can anyway with the laws that we pass here. Thank you. The gentleman from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. I think, Mr. Speaker, um, I, uh, I understand the rationale of this, and just I had a question that I hadn't had a chance to get answered before the debate. I'm really just curious more uh, uh, because this is not an area of, uh, of expertise for me. So if, uh, if Representative Nash will just yield to a quick question. The gentleman will yield. The gentleman uh, from Ramsey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Representative Nash, I'm just wondering, so if right now this is something where if you have a permit, you can't do this, and now you will be able to, what is the distinction between having a permit and then having an actual you know, an endorsement on your license? Sort of what more do you get uh, once you get beyond the permit stage as a, as a motorcycle, as a cyclist. Jump from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Pinto, uh, this is a permit, and you are going through a process of becoming a licensed and endorsed driver on your, on your motorcycle. Um, and this is just another provision to make sure that the person who is on that journey to get their, uh, their endorsement has an opportunity to learn what it's like to drive on an interstate um, so they can be a safer driver when they do have that. John from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess I'm 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 still wondering about about what happens beyond this stage, but I'll deal with that separately. As far as this bill is concerned, it, it I understand the rationale and uh, and thanks for advancing it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The lady from Dakota, Representative May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Nash, I wanted to thank you for bringing this bill forward. And if you had any help uh, getting a bait here to the Capitol to talk to their legislators, I want to thank you for that as well. If I hadn't had constituents come and talk to me, I might be confused about this issue, but uh, they did a really great job explaining it, and I want to thank you for bringing the bill forward. Discussion. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. Members, please vote. The clerk will close the roll. There being 119 ayes and five nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File Number 1876. The clerk will report the bill. House File Number 1876, number six on the calendar for the day, an act relating to data practices of first engrossment. The gentleman from Lyon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker's members. House File 1876 uh, is a drive-off bill. Uh, the Petroleum Retailers Association uh, brought this bill forward. Um, and essentially what's going on uh, is the association is working in conjunction with local business owners uh, throughout the state, uh, local gas stations. When there is a drive-off, um, the 
rather than engaging local uh, law enforcement, uh, the association does the lookup. So if, as you're filling up your fuel, before you get the go-ahead, they usually write your license plate down. Um, and if you happen to drive off by accident or you drive off on purpose to steal, um, the association does the lookup to find out who you are uh, and then send notice. Um, the issue has come up uh, January 6th of 2016. Uh, they were notified that they could no longer do this lookup in the area of leasing because the association was not considered a government entity and wouldn't have access to this. This bill simply allows them to gain access to the lease uh, vehicle so that they could contact those owners directly. Uh, so what they've been doing uh, now is sending that notification to the lease company, so General Motors, whoever happens to own the lease to that, and then hoping that that uh, uh, at least we'll pass it on to the owner of the vehicle. Uh, as an owner of a vehicle, this is not a good thing. Uh, you don't want the, the lease of your vehicle to uh, be involved in that. Um, and this just cuts out a little red tape, um, allows the association to do what they're already doing uh, in the few cases where it's a leased vehicle to have that access to the uh, driver's and the owner's uh, address. And I'd appreciate a green vote. Thank you. Seeing no amendments, the clerk will give the bill its third reading. Uh, third reading, House File number 1876. Third reading. Discussion to the bill. The lady from Hennepin, Leader Hortman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wonder if Representative Fudzinski would yield to a question. The gentleman will yield. The lady from Hennepin. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Fudzinski, I'm wondering on line 1.14, when it says that a trade association can get this information for, uh, quote, performing a member service under section 604.15, if you can tell us what that would be. The gentleman from Lyon. Yes, so um, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative Hortman. So what that means is essentially as a service, uh, because you're a member of the association, uh, you, you're part of that association, and because of that relationship that's already developed between the association and the state, um, then that's how that works. The lady from Hennepin, Leader Hortman. Thank you. If Representative Swidzinski would yield to another question. The gentleman will yield. The lady from Hennepin. I wonder if what could be included in a member service would be lobbying the legislature or um, engaging in campaign activities. Gentleman from Lyon. Um, I, that's not part of this bill, so I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The lady from Hennepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Representative Swidzinski, if you could tell me a little bit about uh, Minnesota Statute 604.15. Is that uh, member services of a, of a particular kind that are enumerated in that statute? The gentleman from Lyon. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I believe it's to do with looking up the, the information when a, a vehicle is a drive-off. The lady from Hennepin, Leader Hartman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Representative Swazinski, I wonder also, same question about the use of ve vehicle registration data under Minnesota Statute 168.345. Is that a limited provision where the data can only be used for a certain purpose? The gentleman from Lyon. Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative Hartman, yes, it's very limited. So uh, there's only, uh, within the office, there's only one or two people that have, you know, guarded access uh, to this information. So it's not even shared with any, it's, you know, these are specific employees that do the lookup. Everything's tracked. So uh, part of an earlier version of the bill uh, was uh, that we were trying to waive a fee because it actually sh saves local governments and the state a lot of money. Um, so a $5 fee is paid per lookup. And so it's a very limited, very tracked uh, this is not a free-for-all looking up information, gathering different things at all. This is very specific to uh, when that situation happens. Billy from Hennepin, Leader Hortman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Swazinski, just one more question, I think. Um, so, Representative Swazinski, under this uh, bill, then w what I understand you to say is that the Petroleum Marketing Association couldn't get a full download of vehicle information and use that in, in electoral communications under the law that we're passing today. The gentleman will yield, the gentleman from Lyon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It'd be my uh, estimation that they would be doing an illegal activity if that was taking place. Lady from Hennepin, Leader Hartman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Swazinski. Discussion to the bill. House file 1876. The clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 122 ayes and three nays, the bill is passed and is titled agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House <laughs> File 3232. The clerk will report the bill. House File Number 3232, Number 7 on the calendar for the day, an act relating to energy, the second engrossment. The lady from right, Representative O'Neill, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. First, I want to thank Representative Wagenius for being on this bill with me. It's not often that I get to share a bill with Representative Wagenius, who is so adept at doing energy policy, so thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Lilly is not here. He is also on the bill, and you know he is recovering, so uh, I also thank him, even though he's not present. Um, House File 3232 makes some small changes to some legislation that we enacted in 2017 regarding solar rewards. We actually, in 2017, extended the solar rewards program by three years, and we added $35 million to the program. And we did that because we had phased out the Made in Minnesota solar program, and this helped kind of uh, navigate through some of those changes. What this bill does is it increased increases the allowable project size from the 20 three, three kilowatts seconds. to 40 kilowatts. So that mirrors the Made in Minnesota solar program. But they must be located on the same site. It also allows a one-year rollover from this calendar year of 2018 into the 2019 calendar year of uncommitted money because it's uh, we're almost, by the time this is enacted, we're going to be halfway through the year. And so there was a fear that they wouldn't be able to use all the money, so they can use it in the following calendar year. And after that, it would be a return back to the Renew Renewable Development Account after that. It also enacts some changes that if we do put this into law, the utility does not have to go back to the Department of Commerce and reapply for the entire program, so it streamlines that a little bit and reduces regulations for the utility. And finally, members, it allows the solar system up to 40 kilowatts to be included in the utility's solar mandate for small solar. We uh, often call it rooftop solar, but it doesn't have to be rooftop. Thank you, members, and that is what this bill does. There is an, amend an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> O'Neill moves to amend House File number 3232. The second engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded A2. The lady from right, Representative O'Neill, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And this is a technical amendment of some things that some of the nonpartisan staff picked out, and so it's just conforming to uh, some technical changes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Discussion to the amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. The amendment is adopted. Now, to the bill as amended, the clerk will give the bill, oh, the clerk will give the bill its third reading. <clears throat> third reading, House File number 3232, as amended. To the bill as amended, the lady from Hennepin, Representative Wagenius. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, raising uh, to 40 is a good idea for some of the folks who do installing. But with uh, opportunities and additional opportunities comes additional responsibility. And as this bill was being negotiated and uh, folks were talking about the additional responsibility, one of the things folks wanted to do was have a potential for folks who are low income to also enjoy the benefits of solar. And that potential was not met. And we don't have peace in the valley. And this is a kind of bill that should have peace in the valley before it goes forward. And I am going to have to note, vote no because we don't have peace in the valley. Discussion, the lady from Hennepin, Leader Hortman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I rise to, to uh, join Representative Wagenius in opposing this bill. The, there's part of it that I can completely agree with, but part of it is problematic. 
you know, over the last um, several months, there's been a stakeholder group that Excel participated in with a number of stakeholders discussing what the um, unspent portion should be allocated to. And then to come to the legislature and change that allocation, I think, kind of is an act in bad faith and not um, consistent with the work that they did through the stakeholder group. So while I have no problem with going from 20 to 40 and the Minnesota companies that will benefit from that, I do have a problem with what um, Representative O'Neill has decided to do with the unspent allocation. So I'll be voting against the bill. Discussion to the bill as amended. The lady from Dakota, Representative May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and members, I won't belabor the point. Uh, Representative Portman and Representative Virginia has made uh, the points very clear, and so while I do support the 20 to 40, um, I cannot support the, the other parts of it, and I will also be voting against the bill. Discussion to the bill is amended. The lady from Wright, Representative O'Neill, to your bill. As amended. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members, and I would just point out that this was brought to me by the installers and the solar industry themselves, and they are okay with that the rollover back to the RDA. So I just want to point that out, that I, this is the first I've heard that anyone is unsatisfied with this bill. I had no one come to me. I had no opposition. But we went through the committee process, so this is the first I've heard of it. So thank you. I look for your support. Thank you. Discussion to the bill as amended. House File 3232 as amended. The clerk will take the roll on the bill as amended. The clerk will close the roll. There being 79 ayes and 44 nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day uh -huh. is House File 4157. The clerk will report the bill. House file number 4157, number eight on the calendar for the day, an act relating to claims against the state, the first engrossment. The gentleman from Olmstead, Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, it's a fairly short, straightforward bill. There are 26 lines that describe where the uh, claims were uh, dispersed. Uh, the first section is exonerations. There are three and they followed all the uh, prescribed procedures and verifications and checks, and the uh, amounts are uh, consistent with what's in statute. Uh, Department of Revenue is the one odd thing in that someone paid taxes to Minnesota that should have been paid to South Dakota. That was discovered, and uh, what it came out to be is they just wanted their dollars back there is no penalty, no interest, nothing uh, additional. And then the Department of Corrections are the normal uh, Department of Corrections claims. And I'm here for any questions, but I, nothing controversial uh, came up this year that's in this bill. Seeing no amendments, the clerk <coughs> will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File number 4157. Third reading, discussion to the bill. The clerk will take the roll on the bill.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 125 ayes and zero nays, House File 4157 is passed and its title agreed to. Without objection, we will revert to messages from the Senate. <clears throat> Message from the Senate, Mr. Speaker. I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following House File, herewith returned as amended by the Senate, in which amendments <coughs> the concurrence of the House is respectfully requested. House file number 3280, an act relating to the environment, and the message is signed Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. <clears throat> Lewick moved that the House refuse to concur in the Senate amendments to House file number 3280, that the Speaker appoint a conference committee of three members of the House, and that the House requests that a like committee be appointed by the Senate to confer on the disagreeing votes of the two Houses. Here they are. Chairman Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair or Mr. Speaker. Uh, yeah, we uh, would like to take this to conference committee. We would not concur. You got to vote on it. Yep. All those in favor? Yep. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. Motion prevails. Announcements by the Speaker. <clears throat> Announcement by the Speaker. The Speaker announces the appointment of the following members of the House to a conference committee on House Bill number 3280. Lewick, Fabian, and Metza. <laughs> Messages from the Senate. <clears throat> Message from the Senate, Mr. Speaker. I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following House file, herewith as amended, uh, returned as amended by the Senate, in which amendments to concurrence of the House is respectfully requested. House file number 817, an act relating to public safety. The message is signed Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. Lunan moves that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House file number 817 and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Senate. I recognize the author. Representative Lunan, who will explain the Senate amendments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Members, this is the uh, bill relating to unauthorized people accessing uh, ATMs and gas pumps. And uh, what this bill does is makes it uh, illegal not only to access the pumps, but to even attempt to access the pumps. The uh, Senate uh, changed some grammatical uh, technicalities on it. Uh, nothing that changed the flavor of the bill at all, and, and uh, I move to concur. Discussion. There being no further discussion, all in favor to the motion to concur with the Senate amendment say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. The motion prevails. The clerk will give the bill its third reading as amended by the Senate. <coughs> House file number 817, third reading as amended by the Senate. Third reading as amended by the Senate. Any further discussion? The clerk will take the roll.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 125 ayes and zero nays, the bill is repassed as amended by the Senate and its title agreed to. Messages from the Senate. <clears throat> Message from the Senate, Mr. Speaker. I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following House file, herewith returned as amended by the Senate, in which amendments to concurrence of the House is respectfully requested. House file number 1975, an act relating to municipal contracting. The message is signed Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. Vogel moves that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House file number 1975 and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Senate. I recognize the author, Representative Vogel, who will explain the Senate amendments. Representative Vogel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this is a bill we passed off the floor nearly unanimously a few weeks ago. The Senate has changed it because of another bill that we passed, which raised the threshold for public bidding from 100,000 to 175,000. So they changed the language to make it consistent with the statute that drives the public bidding for every other public contract. Uh, otherwise, it's exactly the same bill that we had. Discussion. Is there any discussion to the Senate amendments? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. The motion prevails. Any further discussion? There being no further discussion, third clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House Hall number 1975, as amended by the Senate. Third reading. Any further discussion? The clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 122 ayes and three nays, the bill is repassed as amended by the Senate and its title agreed to. <clears throat> message from the Senate, Mr. Speaker. I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following House file, herewith returned as amended by the Senate, in which amendments to concurrence of the House is respectfully requested. House file number 3622, an act relating to insurance. The message is signed Cal R. Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. Hoppy moves that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House file number 3622 and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Senate. The gentleman from Carver, Chairman Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker and members, we are, uh, if we concur with this amendment, we are making a technical correction to a cross-reference in the bill. While we were deb debating this bill on the House floor, somebody from Securian spotted uh, a reference that wasn't quite right. They had co corrected that in the Senate. The Commerce Department and all the uh, involved parties are okay with it. It passed the Senate unanimously. I'd appreciate your support. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the Senate amendments? All in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Motion prevails. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. <clears throat> third reading, House file number 3622, as amended by the Senate. Third reading, as amended by the Senate. Any further discussion? The clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote.
The clerk will close the roll. Representative Salk votes aye. Representative Hornstein votes aye. There being 125 ayes and zero nays, the bill is repassed as amended by the Senate and the its title agreed to. <laughs> motions and resolutions. There are copies of the non-controversial motions at the House desk and online. If there is no objection, we will take action on these motions first. Hearing no objections, the motion prevails. Announcements. The gentleman from Sherburn, Chair Knobloch. Mr. Speaker, members, uh, the Ways and Means Committee will meet in room five, room five at three o'clock. Room five at three o'clock. Announcements. The gentleman from Hennepin, Representative Carlson L. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, uh, being that the DFL members uh, usually meet, meet uh, prior to Ways and Means, uh, today we will not. So we'll join you at, uh, what time did you say? Three o'clock. The lady from Maurer, Representative Poppy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, um, this evening is the annual I-90 Coalition um, event. It is the Bob Gunther party, but we all in southern Minnesota invite you, welcome you, and hope that you are able to join us. Announcements. The gentleman from Rock, Chairman Schumacher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Health and Human Service Reform Committee will be having a joint hearing at 3 p.m. today in Capital 120. Further announcements? Majority Leader Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 10 a.m. Thursday, May 3rd, 2018. Representative Pepin moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 10 a.m. Thursday, May 3rd, 20 and 18. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. Motion prevails. Leader Pepin. I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Pepin moves that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. no. The motion prevails and the House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. Thursday, May 3rd, 20 and 18. <laughs>